Welcome to Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD. This is your host, Dr. Linda Bluestein, former ballet dancer, board certified anesthesiologist, specialist in treating hypermobility disorders, and medical director at Wisconsin Integrative Pain Specialists. Today, Jennifer Milner joins me as a guest co host. Jennifer is a certified Pilates trainer specializing in dancers and post injury recoveries. Our guest today for this inaugural episode of Bendy Bodies is Myra McCormick physiotherapist for the Royal Ballet in London. Mara has been working for many years as a dance specialist physiotherapist with all age groups and now works part-time to allow PhD studies at University College London. Her interests are hypermobility in dance, classical ballet technique, and reducing the risk of injury in the profession. She has also worked in musical theater and contemporary dance, appreciating all dance genres. Mara was trained at the Royal Ballet School graduating to the Royal Ballet Company. After a dance career, including National Ballet of Canada and London Festival Ballet, she completed teacher training in classical ballet, working internationally before embarking on a physiotherapy career. Moira lectures for the Master's in Science Program in Sports Medicine and the Master's in Science Program in Performing Arts Medicine at UCL. Hello, and welcome to Bendy Bodies. Hello, Linda, and hello, Jennifer. Hello. Thank you so much for coming on today. We are so excited to, to chat with you and would love to hear first more about your background. What brought you to where you are today? Well, after that career in dance and uh, finally getting to physiotherapy and finally starting to understand how bodies worked and dancers' bodies worked. Uh, I worked with very young dancers. I worked with adolescents and then finally with uh, professional dancers. And observing over the years, I started to see uh, a pattern. And as physiotherapists, we're always trying to reduce injury. We're trying to prevent injury. We're trying to educate artistic managements. We're trying to educate teachers. I just started to see this very clear pattern and decided that we needed to know more about it. And then I found the relevant specialists to talk to and ask questions of and started to understand about what makes uh, the ballet dancer today. I'm not hypermobile myself, and a lot of people get interested in, the, in this body type, in this physique, because they suffered themselves. And uh, that's definitely not me. It was just observing and trying to understand the really flexible uh, physiques in front of me and the types of injuries they were suffering from. And that's why I, I've ended up here with this particular interest also, I love watching dance and I love watching uh, classical ballet dancers doing what they love to do and also find it very emotional when they fail. And uh, it, it was from that basis that I, I find myself here today with my particular interests. All right, excellent. And specifically, your work with the Royal Ballet, are you able to just Fill us in a little bit more on, about your role there. Well, um, I've worked in the lower school of the Royal Ballet School, where the children start at uh, 11 years old. They also have a program that starts children at seven years old. And mm -hmm. it's a part-time program that brings these children up to a level where they could be chosen to, to uh, go into the vocational school. And then I've worked with the, the adolescents up to uh, 17, 18. Um, and the huge push that it takes to get these 18-year-olds uh, out into uh, professional jobs, to get them up to that standard, um, and to get them into, first of all, of course, the, the Royal Ballet Company, and then out all over the world. So I've, I see the hoops that they have to jump through and the stresses, the physical stresses and the psychological stresses. 
uh, and it's something that uh, I find fascinating still. And so that breadth of experience certainly makes me appreciate what it takes to uh, make it in the profession. Maura, sure. if I could ask a question to follow on that. Um, it's so interesting to me that you were working from the bottom up, starting with the younger students and then moving up and then moving up. Uh, so many companies will start um, at the top down and it's a trickle down effect as to the, the professionals will get the care, but it's, it's been only within the past, um, well, you know, five to 10 years at the most that the students have been getting the attention and the, the preventative training. So I'm wondering, did you choose that? Did, were you interested in starting at the bottom, trying to catch it before they were injured? Or um, is that where they put you and you fell in love with that? Or, or what was the, how, how did that happen? Um, I think I've, I most enjoy working with the adolescents, the, the dancers, the, the young dancers who are growing madly. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, and I, I really like that age group. Uh, and I think I fell into it actually because I was working in a clinic in London. It was one of the first dance medicine clinics. So all sorts of dancers came to see you from the vocational, the professionals, and the amateur dancers uh, of, all, of all sorts. Um, and I, I must admit, I was most interested at that time in the young dancer, the dancer in training, because mm. I was interested in the, the, the basic training of, uh, that, that children get uh, to give them that, that first step up into uh, the vocational schools and how important that first training is in forming those movement patterns, making that dancer understand what uh, technique is. Um, so it was really the, from the training point of view, I was interested as working with young dancers as a physiotherapist, because I felt that the training, the alignment, the biomechanics went hand in hand with treating stresses and strains, physical stresses and strains and injuries and trying to suss out, you know, exactly what has caused this injury. And so often in the young dancer, it is um, technique or deficits in technique and uh, technique that requires correction. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Definitely. And, and so we already talked about this a little bit, but could you go into just a little bit more detail in terms of your, your research in joint hypermobility and what really moved you to actually pursue research in that? Well, there were questions in my mind. And then I remember going to um, a meeting where uh, Professor Rodney Graham was giving a talk on uh, a certain uh, subject to do with hypermobility. And he used to hold these hypermobility clubs, he called it. And so all <laughs> sorts of professionals go along uh, about every six weeks and go to the hypermobility club. And Professor Graham would have an interesting subject to do with, always to do with hypermobility, that everyone would listen to a presentation, ask questions, and consider whether they can take anything from that presentation back to their own work. So it, he was the one who, uh, really got me interested. And then I did remind him that as I was, when I was a student physiotherapist, I had done a, a ward round with him at a small hospital somewhere in Southeast London. And um, he had been very caring and interested in the fact that I had been a ballet dancer. Mm. So we got together later, much later on. And then of course I discovered he'd done a, a, a good study um, at the Royal Ballet School in the early 70s. And he was so interested in, in dance and dancers. And I then suggested to him, why don't we do that again? Why don't we look <laughs> at um, uh, the, tr the, the dancers uh, in the Royal Ballet School? But more than that, let's look at the lower school and let's look at the professional company mm. and let's put the whole picture together and that's what led to um uh the paper that we did together with um 
Dr. Alan Hakim and uh, Janet Briggs, who's also a, a physiotherapist, still a physiotherapist at, uh, at White Lodge, the lower school. So we, got, we all got together and we uh, did the research and came up with uh, that uh, prevalence of hypermobility and benign joint hypermobility syndrome mm -hmm. um, in uh, this particular organization. Okay, and, and we're going to go into some more details about those um, studies in, in just a little bit. And that was just such fabulous work that you did. So I, I'm really excited to hear more about that. Um, can you tell me what you feel are the factors that are most influential in the dancer regarding joint hypermobility and also joint instability? You know, for example, the severity of um, how significant is the the degree to which someone has um, joint hypermobility um, or which joints are uh, hypermobile or unstable or whether or not they have other symptoms, which, what things do you think are most influential? Well, because of where I work, I'm not really going to see any of those seriously Ehlers-Danlos hypermobility type dancers. Mm -hmm. I know that we in the company, we have some dancers who are verging towards that, but at the school, when they do their auditions, they will probably be uh, deselecting anyone mm. with uh, a real hypermobility disorder. They'll, it will become apparent, I think, in the movement patterns you know, when the, the dancer does their first audition. And then when they go through the physiotherapy assessment, um, it will be picked up and then there will be question marks. Um, so we probably won't be seeing the really severely hypermobile children and they won't make it up the ladder into the upper school and into the company because uh, usually it's uh, an injury situation that will eventually, I hate the, the phrase weeding them out, but I'm afraid that is what happens. Mm -hmm. And it becomes too difficult when a, a, a young dancer has injury after injury, mm -hmm. it really sure. becomes so much of a challenge that they opt out, they tend to opt out themselves. When we've, we've got, I mean, we will still have our um, hypermobile, really hypermobile dancers who will have other qualities that are selected by the school. Um, uh, you know, the aesthetic qualities of their movement and their proportions, their face, the beauty, the, all, all of that will get them into a school. Um, and as physiotherapists, we will be aware of uh, this particular uh, vulnerability. And those dancers, fortunately now I can say, we have the ways and means to protect them, to strengthen them, to mm -hmm. give them more control, to monitor them very carefully um, and allow them to survive. So we can do that, uh, but it's, it, it also uh, becomes apparent as the workload goes up, the challenges become more. It's not just dancing half a day, which you do from 11 uh, to 15, it becomes dancing for a whole day uh, mm -hmm. after that. So those stresses and strains will often guide the dancer whether they're going to make it or not and mm -hmm. guide the school whether they should allow the dancer to progress to the upper school. Progressing from school to company is completely um, the artistic management of the company, it's their business to select from the school who they want to come into the company. We don't, we would never interfere with any of that uh, because the very flexible dancers, the more high, the really hypermobile types will make great dancers if they are looked after, if they are educated yes. and if they survive. Yes. To go back to your point about the range of movement, uh, Linda, you said the range of movement and the severity of the joint hypermobility. Well, if we have a huge range of movement, passive range of movement, 
where those legs go all over the place. The, the spine extends fantastically. That's great as long as there is control. Right. So if your passive range is massive in your hip doing a grand battement devant, but the strength to hold a développé is far less than that, we know that there's a huge deficit there in, um, in control and strength. And that is what, as a dancer and as your healthcare team uh, around you, will be working on um, to make that deficit smaller and smaller so that that développé is controlled practically through your whole range. Uh, that's a, a tall order, but that is what we're, that's what our work is about. Then the joint instability we talk about. Well, if you can do a, a great grand battement and the hip goes up freely and with ease and control, that's wonderful. But if that hip also uh, has a bit of excursion within the, the hip joint as it goes up, and we end up with a, an impingement at the front of the hip because the articulation of the hip has not been totally controlled and mm -hmm. there is excursion there uh, and the joint moves, the, the head of the femur moves uh, freely, slides freely within the, the acetabulum, then we are going to be in for for. for problems and we have to work very hard on stabilizing that joint decreasing the amount of instability the amount of excursion and only allow it uh, to uh, articulate to allow the uh, the range of movement in flexion or in if we're going a la seconde to uh, abduction and 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 flexion and uh whichever range of movement we're talking about, but we have to stabilize before the, the extreme ranges are used. I'm not sure if I explained that well, but it, it's that sort of principle for all of the joints um, uh, throughout the body, that there is a deep stabilization first before great range of movement. Yes. So th that, yeah, you explained that very well, and that makes that makes a lot of sense. And for um, any of our listeners who who want just a super like quick visual of, about that, I I tend to think of Gumby versus Raggedy Ann. That you know the green Gumby, which some of our listeners are probably way too young to know what Gumby is, um, but I think of Gumby who you know the the whole thing that you can kind of bend them all over the place, but Raggedy Ann is just kind of floppy and. We don't want that. That's that's a real concern. So I think that um, you know you explained that very very well, and that's that's so important. Um, and we'll get more into this later with social media and the influence that 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 has, because <laughs> <laughs> that's a, a whole uh, introduces a whole other factor in, into this for sure. Um, when you first started researching hypermobility, did you observe that there were more hypermobile dancers at any particular level, whether it be pre-adolescent or adolescent pre-professionals or professionals? Not really, because there was a, you know, you, they're all, they all have to be hypermobile. All the dancers in a vocational school are chosen for their hypermobility. Uh, it's that spectrum of hypermobility that uh, we are concerned about. And so every uh, vocational school will have a scattering of more extreme uh, hypermobiles and you can see them you walk into a, a studio and you can you can see them you can pick them out as you watch them work same with um, the upper school the 16 the 16 to 18s uh, you can see them you see that type of movement that range of movement that at that age that slight loss of control but you think, oh, there's potential there. That's why they are selected. They see the, the, our artistic stuff, see the flexibility, and they immediately think, oh, there's something more we can get out of these dancers. Uh, and then in the company, 
we still see we see those uh, dancers that have been selected into the profession, but the deficits start to become a little bit more noticeable because the, certainly within um, a hardworking classical ballet company, the challenges are on. The challenges to stamina, robustness, that ability to keep going, work long hours, not much time to recover, and six days a week, and evenings as well with performances. So that's when the deficits start to become uh, apparent. And then the dancer tends to uh, accumulate lots of small injuries. Mm -hmm. Uh, And in spite of, often in spite of uh, being shown, this is what we've got to do. We've got to get all that control. We do our Pilates and we do very specific dance-centered Pilates exercises to get that control. We've got the gym and we have our trainers who... uh, Uh, sort out a a program for you to increase your strength. Um, uh, We still see uh, our um, more flexible dancers start to fail, unfortunately. So we see them all the way through. But as our, our, and I think our research that we did way back, looking at uh, how, as you go through the ranks of the company, the uh, very hypermobile dancers tend to uh, become less and less and in our principal ranks. Yes. Hardly are you, any. Hardly are you talking any. about the 2004 research article? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. And, and I think that holds today. That's great because we, I mean, that's not great, but I, we will have a link to that article so that people can, can access it. So um, yes, I was hoping that you would, that you would comment on that, um, that, that excellent article that you published. You know, it's quite old and it has its, its faults. I mean, we, we, we know that, but it was uh, interesting at the time just to see that pattern. And of course, every, everything that we try to do within the company to prevent uh, injury and prolong careers uh, still, we will get those dancers that fall through the net for all sorts of reasons. Um, sometimes dancers, I find that hypermobile dancers have to work harder than a lot of the others. They have to be extremely organized. They have to make sure that they have got their control and their strength uh, in uh, woven into their schedules every single week. But it's hard to take holidays. You know, you can't go away for a week and do nothing. Uh, sadly, <laughs> uh, I think you decondition these, I think hypermobile dancers decondition faster than a, a more tightly knit type of physique. Mm-hmm. And so to keep that baseline work going, just baseline and still have a holiday is really, really important. Uh, the recovery is terribly important and dancers still find it very difficult to understand how to recover and I say but that's being professional you know you've got to push yourself one day and the next day has to you have to back off a bit and we have dancers in the company who simply can't jump uh, every single day we have male dancers who can't jump every day. They have to jump hard for one day and then recover the next. And I think it's even more important for the hypermobile dancer because of muscle strength and what it takes to keep that muscle strength um, up high enough to uh, cope with the the challenges of a a week, a month, uh, three months in a, a program where they're performing and rehearsing often many different ballets at the same time Mm -hmm. that that's an excellent point so you're saying that rather than maybe some non-hypermobile dancers who can have the load that maybe would stay fairly consistent from one day to the next and they might even be able to take a week off and and not lose as much ground the hypermobile dancers may need to actually have some um, rest days from certain activities or decrease the load on certain 
joints even during the week, but then likewise, they also really would have more trouble if they take a whole week off. Yes, okay. and I think uh, that is our job within uh, a healthcare department is to make them aware of that and to educate them. And, and then it's up to the dancer to take that on board and be very, very clever about how they organize their week and how they organize their energy and where they push and where they pull back. Very hard to, that's very hard to tell any dancer uh, and get them to really understand that. But I think it's even more important with the, the hypermobile dancer because, I mean, we see uh, there is information that tells us that uh, they fatigue easily. Uh, they find it hard to get that stamina up and keep it up. They find it hard to uh, strengthen and then keep the strength there. Uh, but with the right information, the right support, many do manage it. And sure. I learn from them. I watch them and I, I watch how, once they've really become very experienced, I watch how they work and how they organize their, their, their energies, as I said. And that's when we learn from, mm -hmm. from those very clever ones. And, you know, I've, uh, something I wanted to add, there's not mm -hmm. much room for, it's, how do I put it in the, a respectful way, a lazy dancer. <laughs> <laughs> you get some of those really beautifully hypermobile dancers that they, they look gorgeous, the legs are, are all over the place. They find it easy. And there's a, uh, a temptation to s just settle back a bit and rely on how they look and what they and what they can get away with but when the the challenges are really on and the workload goes right up that's when they fail mm -hmm. so there's not much room for for um a dancer who isn't willing to uh you know put in the effort and put in the the brain power, thinking things through, and then uh, the discipline, of course, to carry it all out. So I hope all my hypermobile dancers are listening to this <laughs> 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 because you have just given so much for dancers to unpack just in the past five minutes about um, how they decondition more quickly, um, about how recovery is harder, about how they have to plan their weeks very specifically and deliberately, and about how you cannot depend on your naturally beautiful body to carry you throughout your career that you have got to put in the work and maintain what you've got that's there's so much greatness that you just said thank you so much <laughs> absolutely you put it in a nutshell there jennifer <laughs> <laughs> and that and that nutshell i think is you know dancers are of course artists but also athletes and that also holds true for especially for people that are hypermobile but for other hypermobile art artists athletes as well um, i'm thinking of other people that I know, patients, and, that, and those exact same um, strategies would work for them as well. Yes, you can't be an artist and really express unless you have a basis of real stamina and strength and you're on top of everything. If you're struggling, you, the, the artistic side of your performance really goes out the window. Mm. I I 100% agree with that. And I have worked with um, an extremely well-known performer who um, came to me and she was in her, I think, 60s when she and I started working together. And I said, what do you want to get out of these sessions? She was just about to start a new show. And she said, I need you to get me to the point where I don't have to think about it when I go on stage. I have to get enough strength and enough um, biomechanical correctness in it that when I go out on stage, I can just let it go and perform. And that's so true, especially with the hypermobile dancer, giving themselves that strength and that position of strength to move from so that they can layer the artistry on top of it. Exactly. That's exactly what um, we're, we're on about here. Fabulous. The article that we were just discussing um, just very recently here that you had published in 2004 and then you had also published a follow-up article in 2009. 
And that was called joint, the first one was called joint laxity and the benign joint hypermobility syndrome in student and professional ballet dancers. And in that study, you found an 11 fold increase in hypermobility in, in dancers in both the ballet school and the professional company. And we had talked about this a little bit, but, but also um, you also had commented in that article about joint pain being more common in the, in the dancers, especially who had other features of at that time, we used the phrase benign joint hypermobility syndrome. We've replaced that now, but at that time, that was the um, terminology that was being used, especially if they had stretchy skin and joint dislocations. And I'm curious if you believe that that still holds true in terms of the, the joint pain um, in different places of the body being more common in dancers that have these other um, features, the, the stretchy skin and appear to have joint dislocations. Of course, we can't tell for sure without doing imaging, but we can get a pretty good idea, like you said, watching them move. Yes. Well, dancers often talk about being used to pain and dancing in pain. And I do think that pain is just part of the job. Uh, they are often, well, our dancers at Royal Ballet, who have a very high workload, they're often working with a problem, but they're managing it. They know that it's a dodgy ankle that they're looking after, but it's strong enough and they're maintaining it enough and they're coming for treatment and they're holding it all together. So they're still able to get on stage and fulfill all their, their work commitments. So they do talk about, dancers do talk about working in pain and certain joints or their backs, their spines being painful, but, but I'm managing it. I know what it is. It's been diagnosed. I know what treatment helps. I know what I have to do to make it feel better. And I can, I can get back on stage uh, with confidence. So they do talk about it. They do also still suffer. I think our dancers still suffer from quite a lot of soft tissue injuries, especially tendinopathies mm. it's one of the the bugbears because once a tendon starts to become reactive we know that it takes quite a long time yes to rehab mm -hmm. it and turn it around and develop the strength and settle down the tendon and get going again it has a prolonged healing time and that's what that follow-up paper was really told us, oh, we've got a lot of tendon problems. Mm. Um, and at that time, you know, the, the research into tendinopathy wasn't as, as advanced as it is today. So thankfully, we do have a good understanding of how to treat uh, tendinopathy and, and how to prevent it. Uh, so our approach to a lot of the soft tissue uh, injuries now is much more organized, educated, and we can explain exactly what's going on to the dancer and what the prognosis is. That's excellent. And, and as somebody who has a lot of tendinopathies myself, I would, uh, I would love to hear if you, have, if you are able to elaborate at all on what the newer strategies are that you're using for treating tendinopathies. A lot of it is to do with uh, developing strength in the, the muscle that the tendon belongs to so if it's patella tendinopathy you know it's you've got to go for quads you you know mm -hmm. our quads have to be much stronger than dancers think they should be landing from a an entrelacé or a grand jeté en tournant landing and holding that fondue with your leg in a high uh, arabesque I mean, the stresses that go through that tendon uh, are enormous. And so our, our female dancers are in the gym doing single leg squats, double leg squats, and lifting their own, the, the weight of their own bodies. They're using a, a leg press with high load uh, through the quads, through the tendon uh, to prevent if they've had tendinopathy before, they have a forever on, they have uh, their own uh, workout to prevent it coming back again. And that is high load and really good strength. And it's also uh, the use of isometric um, exercises before, just before a, a, a big rehearsal, 
you do your isometrics on your um, on your quads to just prepare you for that particular uh, rehearsal. So there are there's there's some really good good stuff out there that we can use with our dancers, and then they take the ball and run with it. It's up to them to do their preventative work. Of course, you know that that cycle of pain and then not being able to do your exercises because of pain and that cycle, that vicious cycle you get into uh, with tendinopathy, it's getting in, it's trial and error with every single physique and looking for how you're going to uh, help each different physique cope with uh, the stresses and move through uh, the tendinopathy to recovery. It's true that with tendinopathies, it is a, there's no one size fits all um, no. and trying to find that unique pathway. And I think um, just in the past few years, uh, our approach to tendinopathies has changed so much. And so acknowledging that, like acknowledging that there isn't really a one size fits all in general, are there interventions that you think are, are most important? And I, I don't even want to say interventions, maybe pre-interventions um, to help improve the longevity of a hypermobile dancer's career. Uh, you had mentioned at the beginning, you know, Pilates or this or that. And what do you think are some things you have seen useful um, over the long term? Well, over the last, just the last, uh, the recent sort of five years, it's all been strength, strength, strength. Yes. Um, but I think, you know, all of us working with, well, I have been wanting dancers to do loaded strength work 20 years ago because mm. you look at what they do on stage and you go, um, control work is always very important, but control work is not going to allow that muscle to absorb high eccentric loads of landing in a, from a very high jump. So, it's obvious that you need more strength in the lower limb in dancers. So it is strength, but we cannot do without the control. It's strength and control dovetail beautifully together. So all the Pilates work and then the gym work and the two go beautifully together. I'm talking about uh, professional dancers and the pre-professionals. Uh, we're always careful with loading uh, the younger dancer, you know, the, 11, uh, mm -hmm. the, the adolescents who are growing, we have to be very careful and organized in loading. But just as you, if you're getting a, a, an adolescent to do, you know, to perfect a grand jeté en tournant and that, that hold in a, a, an arabesque en fondue, then you've got to put those forces in a very controlled way through mm -hmm. that young body so that they can do the technical stuff in the, in the studio. So, you know, those two go together. And then, of course, it's the stamina work, basic stamina work, you know, uh, swimming, bicycle, cross trainer, all of those things that get the circulation up and get the dancer to exert themselves over a period of time without fatiguing. That's what we go for with uh, the stamina work and as a background. And then it's, you know, it's fairly straightforward, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, what you need to do. With the young dancer who is not at a vocational school where things are uh, available and trainers are available there to control exercise regimes, then it takes a little bit more uh, organization for them to put in those elements as best they can to support their work. And unfortunately, you know, those dancers who are not at vocational schools but are doing a, a lot of uh, serious training, uh, they, I, I've seen it, they lose out. Uh, they, you mm -hmm. definitely need a, a good advisor to help you organize your week. Uh, so you're putting in uh, some of those elements, or really all of those elements, in a, a, a very balanced way. Yes. So it's not just spending more time 
in the dance studio that makes you a better dancer. It's being smart with your time in the dance studio and then knowing what else you need to get outside of the dance studio, whether it's swimming or strength training or control training is, is what you're saying is learning how to yes. sort of put that whole thing together. Yes, exactly. And I mean, even our young dancers in the companies and can fail because they've, they've been so enthusiastic, usually uh, the men, the young men, so enthusiastic that after class, they really want to practice again and again, their double tours, their revel tards, their manege, um, and do all of that wonderful stuff that they, because they're young and they're, uh, they're in the corps de ballet of the company, they don't get to do all of that on stage. <laughs> so they end up wanting to do all of that because it's such fun. And <laughs> they haven't actually put the time into the gym to get that strength. And then mm -hmm. they come limping in with mm -hmm. problems and bone stress. And then you find out. And then they learn. Of course, they learn through those, right. uh, those uh, mistakes. Right. Absolutely. And, and I will say here too, that Royal Ballet um, and Royal Ballet School have, are absolutely the gold standard to me for how to integrate dance science and dance medicine into an institution. Um, the work that you have done, uh, taking it from your pre-professionals and your middle school and the whole way through, it's been such a deliberate and thoughtful approach to building a, a healthier dancer that I think anyone else should be looking at and, and trying to emulate. So you guys are really the gold standard to my mind. Well, uh, and I'm just I did a, a cog in the <laughs> wheel and part of a, you know, part of a, a team, but it's, it is very heartening to see all of that coming together. It's been great having everybody here today for Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD. Today, our guest has been Moira McCormick, physiotherapist for the Royal Ballet Company in London. And please go to bendybodies.org for links to more information. We will have links there to where you can get more information about the different research projects that Moira has done and things for dance teachers, for parents, etc., and dancers themselves. Thank you for listening to this episode. Because it was so packed full of great content, we decided to make our discussion with Moira a two-part series, and we've come to the end of part one. Please be sure to subscribe to the Bendy Bodies podcast so you'll be notified as soon as we publish part two of our discussion. Thank you, and we'll catch you next time. If you've enjoyed this program, please like, share, subscribe, and leave a review. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not a substitute for medical advice. Please see your own medical team prior to making any changes to your health care. Bendy Body's original music is by Andrew Savino and sound editing is by Rhett Gill. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you next time on Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD.